Hey guys, my name's Sam and welcome to Prep Medic. This week's video, we're talking heart attacks, how to recognize them and how to treat them. Before we get too far into this video, I should say that this is not medical advice. I am just some guy on the internet and you need to make sure that you are following your own local policies, procedures, and laws before you treat a patient. That being said, all of this information is true to my knowledge at this point in time when this video is filmed, but be aware that medical knowledge and accepted practice changes over time. So just because this is accurate right now doesn't mean it will still be accurate accurate in a year, five years, 10 years, however long this video survives on the internet. So take everything I say with a grain of salt and make sure that you are doing your own digging into these topics besides this video on YouTube. I want to make it clear that this video is not for medical providers. I'm going to kind of simplify certain topics on here so it's a little bit more palatable. Just keep that in mind as you watch going forward. So jumping into it, the first thing we have to talk about is anatomy. And don't worry, I'm not going to go super in depth here, but we do have to understand why a heart attack occurs. So your heart is surrounded by coronary arteries. Your heart is simply a muscle with a very specific job. And just just like your muscles, it needs its own blood supply, which coincidentally the heart supplies for itself, just like it supplies everything else in your body. So when your heart relaxes at diastole, you actually have some blood flow that comes back down into the coronary arteries and allows blood flow into the heart. Now these arteries are relatively small and it is not uncommon for them to be clogged by plaques or clots or even have uh, a spasm from illicit drug use or certain stimulants. When these arteries are clogged for any reason and blood cannot get past the artery, you have what's called a heart attack. You have muscle that is starved for oxygen and it will start to die if it does not receive oxygen in the near future. One thing I do want to talk about in this video is the difference between cardiac arrest and a heart attack. A lot of times we hear people say, oh, they had a heart attack, and what they're really meaning is cardiac arrest. Here's the point I want to make. A heart attack and a cardiac arrest are two separate things, and while a heart attack can cause a cardiac arrest, a cardiac arrest can also be caused by a myriad of other issues. So keep that in mind as we go forward. Just because somebody dies doesn't mean they had a heart attack. All right, next thing we need to talk about is we need to talk about risk factors. Who's going to have a heart attack? Now, this is very general. Just because somebody has these things, all of these things, or none of these things doesn't mean they are going to have a heart attack or aren't going to have a heart attack. These are just the demographics that are most likely to have one. First and foremost, we have hypertension, high cholesterol, obesity, diabetes, bad diet, sedentary lifestyle, a family history of heart conditions, tobacco use, age, and illicit drugs, particularly stimulants. Once again, if you have these things, it doesn't mean you're going to have one, It, but it does increase the likelihood you will. Let's talk symptoms. What is somebody actually going to experience when they're having a heart attack? Now, I want to really drive home that people can have a wide variety of symptoms ranging from hurt fingers to the crushing chest pain. That's kind of the hallmark. So people can experience this differently, but I'm going through kind of, like I just said, the hallmark symptoms that are kind of the, the classic telltale signs of a heart attack. Just be aware outliers do exist. So the first one that you're probably familiar with is going to be chest pain. Now this chest pain will oftentimes radiate to the back down the left arm, but it can also radiate down the right or up into the jaw. And this pain will generally not be made any better or worse with positioning of the patient. If they're laying on their side, it'll probably feel just as bad as if they're sitting up. You might have some exacerbation with exercise or activity, but that is not universal and that is not always seen. Now, a next super common symptom is going to be nausea and diaphoresis, so cold sweats. If you walk in some Somebody's complaining of chest pain, they're nauseous and they're sweating. That is a huge red flag that anyone that works in emergency services will tell you this patient is having the big one, a massive heart attack, and you need to get them to the hospital ASAP. 
Aside from that, you can see uh, shortness of breath and lightheadedness are also both really common findings. Now, with the shortness of breath, usually that's not going to be the feeling of, hey, I feel like I can't breathe through. I feel like I'm, I'm breathing through a straw or it's actually like physically tight. Usually what people describe with the shortness of breath is it feels like they just ran a marathon and they cannot catch their breath. And this is a sign that they're not oxygenating their heart well, which once again is what a heart attack is actually like boils down to that's what it is um so these are some of the most common symptoms now be aware that women and diabetics will experience heart attacks very differently not not exclusively not universally but a lot of times women will complain of uh digestive issues same with diabetics or you might have kind of this weird pain or flu-like symptoms so be aware that in these two demographics you have to dig a little bit deeper for what is actually going on so now we know what a heart attack is. We know the risk factors for it and we know the symptoms to look for. Let's talk about treatment. And this is going to disappoint a lot of people because this is not something that you can treat at home. This is not something a chiropractor or essential oils is going to cure for you on your home couch. First and foremost, we have to call 911. The temptation is, especially when we have a little bit of training, is to drive the patient directly to a hospital because that feels like it's going to be faster. And while you might be able to get to the hospital faster than it takes to call 911, get an ambulance, and then have them transfer you, it is important to call 911 because those paramedics on the ambulance, if you are somewhere where advanced life support is present or somewhere where a basic life support provider like an EMT can still do an EKG and submit it, is that they have diagnostic capabilities. So they're able to do a 12 lead EKG on your heart, tell you exactly what kind of heart attack it is, and then take you to the closest appropriate facility while activating a cardiac or STEMI alert at that facility. That saves a lot of time in the long run. What that means is that they're going to do the EKG. They're going to determine if you are having an ST segment myocardial infarction, which is a kind of of heart attack. And then they know what facilities are capable of treating that. So not every hospital has the ability to go into your femoral artery or your radial artery and physically, essentially roto-rooter that clot out and put a balloon and a stent in place to keep that uh, coronary artery open. Not everywhere can do that. So they might decide to go to a hospital that's farther away than the closest one to you. And unless you're trained, you might not know what the capabilities are. The second thing they're going to do is they're going to activate an alert. A lot of these interventional cardiologists are not in house and they actually have to be called in from home, usually have 20 minutes to half an hour to respond. And they get that ball rolling right away. Whereas if you just hit the door, you saved maybe three minutes getting into the hospital, but now you have to wait another 20, 30 minutes for that interventionalist to get in and start treating you, which is why 911 is so important. There are some other things you can do at home as you're waiting for an ambulance or you're starting that uh, transfer process to a hospital. First and foremost is going to be aspirin administration. So the dose changes, and obviously you have to consult with your own healthcare provider about the potential risks for aspirin. There are people that can't take aspirin. There are uh, contraindications to it, so make sure you're familiar with those. But in general, what you're going to do is you're going to take four 81 milligram tablets of baby aspirin and you're going to chew it. So you actually absorb the aspirin a lot quicker as you chew it because you get some buccal absorption, which is the mucous membranes around your gums and under your tongue. And that's actually going to allow it to start working faster. You can chew adult aspirin, but it's going to taste a lot worse than the grape or orange flavored ones you can get for children. So you take four of those, that equals 324 milligrams of uh, aspirin. The next thing you can try is nitroglycerin. Now, nitroglycerin is a vasodilator. It decreases afterload. It might aid in a little bit of coronary perfusion and help with some of that chest pain. However, there is not strong data to suggest it is actually helping with survivability a whole lot down the road. Also, I would say if you're not prescribed nitroglycerin and you don't know what it does to you, what uh, the contraindications are for it. This can be kind of risky with pretty minimal benefits in this situation. So if you're prescribed it, absolutely take the nitroglycerin. If you see somebody and they're having a heart attack, they have these symptoms, they have it prescribed to them. You could 
help them administer it to themselves. But honestly, if it were me, I'm not going to go out and take the nitroglycerin tabs and start giving them to people without an EKG and an IV in place, simply because you can get pretty substantial drops in blood pressure, which is a pretty bad situation when you're already not perfusing your heart that well. So take that for what it's worth. A nitroglycerin Glycerin is usually dosed at 0.4 milligrams, and it's usually administered sublingual, so that's under the tongue. It can come in a spray form or a tablet form. I will say that this is a common medication on the ambulance and is part of our chest pain formula for somebody having a heart attack. Last but certainly not least, we want to relax the patient as much as possible. Now, this might seem kind of silly, but essentially when your heart is beating faster, when they are exerting themselves, uh, standing up, walking upstairs, going for run, any of those things, that is actually going to increase the heart's oxygen demand and it can actually speed up the death of the heart muscle. So keeping somebody relaxed, not having them walk on reasonable distances is going to make a large difference in their outcome down the road. Throughout all of this, you need to be ready to manage cardiac arrest. Somebody going into cardiac arrest is quite common in these scenarios, so we have to make sure we know CPR and that we have enough people around us to do effective CPR until rescuers arrive. That is all I have for this video. I hope it was informative and didn't get too far into the weeds. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments, and I will see you next week. 